We are in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, so uh, turn her with me. And by the way, uh, Monday night, I, uh, you never guess what I had for dinner jalapeno poppers. And uh, I only had about six of them. If you weren't here last Sunday, that wouldn't make much sense, but uh, they, they were really good. Let me just uh, read. We, we worked a couple messages on the first half of chapter 8. We're just going to try to look at the second half today and, and try to hopefully make it make sense for you, whether you're the first time here or you've been here for a long time. But Verse 7 says, For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. And it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. And I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated uh, will soon disappear. He's going to, he's, he quoted this verse from Jeremiah verbatim. He's going to quote it again in chapter 10, and in chapter 10, instead of saying Judah and Israel, he's going to use the third person, them. Them, and it's going to refer to the audience that he's speaking to, then and now, I say that because um, there are theologians who don't believe that what Jeremiah wrote was for people like you and me who are Gentile believers. We're participants, we're beneficiaries, but, but God particularly had just Judah and Israel in mind when it came to the new covenant. And um, my... Uh, Main commentator, Dr. Allen at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, made one little reference to a guy by the name of Dr. McComsky, who is a PhD in Semitic languages and Old Testament at Trinity Evangelical Seminary, and that he refuted that hands down, that thought that in the New Covenant, it does not directly apply, or it does directly apply to people like you and me, Gentiles. So I bought his book, and that's what I've been working through all week long. And so here's the dilemma for you and me, or for you. I have to read through all this stuff and, and figure out what can keep you awake <laughs> and what can't. <laughs> because a lot of this stuff I'm really interested in, but some of it you're probably not too interested in. And so I want to give you the good stuff, I want to give you the highlights and give you the information that you need, that you can, that you're interested in, and that you can make an application to. At the same time, I like proving my point and my case and, and giving the evidence where it exists in order to show what we're trying to say. So it was a rough week for me to say all that. Uh, and, and Dr. McComsky, uh, there were many times in his book, he was way over my head. And I had to reread it and rethink it. And I just didn't have enough time to work through a lot of things that he was proposing. But it wasn't necessary for our uh, take and, and for mine at this juncture. But I did learn some things. That I, I just didn't have a good framework in mind of how the big picture fit together, particularly with the promise to Abraham, to the Mosaic Covenant, uh, which was to Israel, then the Davidic Covenant, and then the New Covenant. And those are the four major icons 
in the Old Testament that you have to deal with. And there, might, there needs to be a flow. There needs to, they need to fit together. They need to work together. There needs to be a thesis all throughout there, uh, all through, all through those icons, uh, to get where we are today. And putting that all together is not the easiest thing to do. If you were to just isolate Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 verses, you would come away and thinking that this was just for Judah and Israel. But if you look at the entire Word of God, and there were just a plethora of places, you would see, uh, not only from what he, how he changed it in Hebrews chapter 10 to apply to the, because he was speaking to Jewish Christians. He was speaking to New Testament Christians. He was speaking to Christians who were part of the church. How he, how he uh, addressed Jeremiah 31 in chapter 10, as opposed to the way he did it here in chapter 8, there are just, that's just one place. There are, there's just hundreds of places and we, we're not going to have time to go there. So I'm just going to give you a couple little thoughts about that it's because we got to get to the application. We, I got to get to a couple things as we draw this together and how it's going to make sense for you and what, how it can help you in your life. It, it is meaningful. And I say two, because I, I can really give you the first one first. And there would be three, so there'd be two at the end. I, I could give you one right now, which would be really the third one. I was working through all this stuff. In fact, I put put my little map up here, uh, if you can. Is it up there? Yes. No. It's on the screen here. There we go. See, that's all plain, isn't it? <laughs> Just crystal clear. I need somebody to put that on a PowerPoint is what I need to do. And so maybe somebody can help me out on that. Because I just, you know, I really just did the map yesterday. You know, I'm just putting all this stuff together. I looked at a lot of different charts. I didn't like any of them. So I said, I'm just going to make my own. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on up there. But <laughs> so to put all this stuff together, I was thinking in that third point, which I'm making the first point on the application. So I was working through all this this week and reading, you know, Dr. McComsky and, and so many different scriptures. I was sitting there in my office <clears throat> and I was thinking, Lord, I, I am, I am so excited about investigating your word. I mean, you went to such trouble and and the way you worked, when you begin to investigate the way God worked, you, you see, you uncover, you unveil things you, in rooms you've never been in before. You never had an idea that God worked in this way and over in this place and through this person in the way that he did. You, I mean, certainly you, you have some understanding about how that worked through the uh, the years and then the decades that you've been a Christian, but then as you begin to really investigate, you go, I had no idea. It's like the fog is beginning to lift. And so I was, I was studying all this and I was investigating all this. I was just talking to the Lord and I said, Lord, I'm interested. I'm interested. I want to know. I want to spend time working over what you pained yourself over, what you labored so hard, what you worked so hard through the fabric of human history to bring the blessing of your son to my life. I don't want to just pass that over like a commercial and hit the mute button. And I I just was overcome at that moment with the presence of God while I was sitting there in my little office over there. Nobody else was watching. Nobody else was looking. And I say that to you because what God did for me, he can do for you. But you must be willing. You must have a desire to want to spend some time with him. You know, the, wor the work that I do 
is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. The end is so that you'll be so desirous and encouraged to leave this place and wanted to investigate the Lord yourself. You'll want to have that presence of God in your life for yourself, just like I had it. Everything that's available to me is available to you. But it'll take some time. I'm just interested. Are you? Well, my investigation led me to this little thing here. So, <clears throat> because uh, I was just going to give you some thoughts here, okay? There's a lot of stuff going on here. But if you'll notice here, I've got some circles. Here is the Abrahamic covenant God made. Here's the Mosaic covenant. Here's the Davidic covenant. Here's the new covenant. Um, those are the main things. Now, this Abrahamic covenant is like the David, Davidic, and it's like the new. It's not like the Mosaic. The mosaic is different. The Abrahamic covenant is eternal. It's unconditional. It, is a prom it has a promise of the seed. It has promise of kings. And it has a promise for Gentiles through the lineage of Abraham. It is a promise that is unconditional by the Lord. This promise that God made to Abraham goes on and on and on and on. It goes all through the Old Testament. It keeps going through the New Testament. It goes into the millennial reign of Christ. And this promise will exist forever. And so we're involved in that because God made this promise to Abraham and his descendants and said the seed that would come would be a blessing to the whole nation, to all the Gentiles. So that's just one place that God had you in mind. He actually had you in mind before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter one. He chose you and he adopted you to be into his family. That happened prior to the foundation of the world. It happened prior to time and space. Uh, Isaiah chapter 49, the seed is called the servant by Isaiah. The Messiah is the servant and the servant, servant is the only place that says this, is a covenant. He is the covenant, the Messiah, the servant of God, and he will be in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 6, a light unto the Gentiles, to all of us. Now this new covenant that God speaks about, he's going to do a new thing. New denotes something old. The old is the Mosaic covenant. God gave his promise to Abraham and all his descendants by faith, 2000 BC. 1500 BC, Moses comes around. The Israelites, and God makes this covenant with them. And 1000 BC is going to be the Davidic covenant, and then the new covenant that's going to be prophesied for the future will be in 605 BC. We have here uh, the cross which is the inauguration of the New Testament or the new covenant that you and I live in today. Now, the problem is, is that people don't really know what to do with the Mosaic covenant. How does it fit? How does it work? Because the Mosaic covenant is not eternal. The Mosaic covenant is temporary. Uh, in fact, in um, Ephesians, Chapter 2 and verse 14, we're told that it is temporary. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, the law was put into place temporarily until the seed should come, the seed being the Messiah. So it's not eternal, it's not like, and it's not the promise like Abraham. It's a covenant. Now, the Abrahamic covenant was cut with blood, the Mosaic was cut with blood, the and the Davidic and the new were cut with blood. And then the, it all became a fulfillment when Christ cut the covenant with his own blood. But the Mosaic was, what, what was it exactly? Well, you understand it as the Ten Commandments, but actually there were 613 commandments. And what was God doing? God, it was his calling card. 
God was saying to these people, this is what I am like. This is what righteousness looks like. This is what righteousness by my children, by those who live in the kingdom, this is how they will live. They will live righteously. And so it held the standard up of God. And so it also held up the sinfulness of man. Because man, when he saw the righteousness of God through the Mosaic Covenant, he saw how sinful he was. Now, some people say, well, it's like God was setting the people up for failure. No. Because what man would do, an Israelite would do when he's in this Mosaic Covenant, is he would look at it and he would see the righteousness of God. He would see his own sinfulness and he would go, I'm an utter failure. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a great thing. That's what people need today. Because that Old Testament saint would then go, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I can't become a kingdom of priests, a priest like you want me to be someday unless you send a deliverer, unless you send a Messiah. And so that's why Paul called the Mosaic Law a tutor. It was a tutor to lead us to Christ. How so? It showed us our sinfulness by showing us the righteousness of God. Now the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 that Christ was the end of the law. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that God, the Lord Jesus, tore down the wall of hostility. Because once we were foreigners, we were alien, aliens, we were cut out of the covenant of God. We were outside. The wall that was the wall, wall of hostility was the Mosaic law. And the Lord, when he fulfilled the law, he tore it down so that he, there would be no distinction, Ephesians chapter 2, between the Jew and the Gentile, and he could make one man. So all of this in the Mosaic was a picture. That's all it was. The Abrahamic covenant was a promise, but the Mosaic law was a picture of what God was like, particularly in the tabernacle. That's where we see what Christ is like, what the Messiah would be like. But none of this could save us, as we all know. Well, this went along for 1,530 years until we came to the cross. In the meantime, the Lord made it more specific about how the Messiah was going to come. It was going to be through Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob. And then there were 12 tribes, and which tribe? Then Judah was picked. It wasn't until 1000 BC that we learned who was going to come out of Judah, and that was David. And out of David was going to come the Messiah who would sit on the throne of David and who would fulfill, listen now, the new covenant the new covenant is about a person that would be the lord jesus christ in the new covenant the lord said i'm going to make a new covenant this word new is kindness it's not nuos nuos means like a new car in a car lot it's a new car but it's among a lot of other new cars no kindness is no there was never a new like this before this kind of new never existed before. This is a brand new, brand new, brand spanking new that's never been happened before. That's this new, as opposed to the old, the old being the Mosaic Covenant. That covenant that God made with our forefathers back there in the Exodus, God says, it's not going to be like that one. It was conditional, as long as you obey me. No, this one's going to be unconditional. This is going to be like the promise of Abraham. In fact, it's going to fulfill the promise of Abraham. And it's fulfilled the promise of Abraham in part. Now, someday in the future, in the millennial reign, it will fulfill it completely. Right now, those needs are met, or that scripture in Jeremiah is fulfilled spiritually. And so the Lord said, and here's what he's going to do. Now we can finally get off of this. And we'll just rile this up for you. But here's what he was going to promise to do in Jeremiah 31. He promised to write his Torah <clears throat> on the hearts of his people. The Lord fulfilled the Torah for us. And therefore, he could write the Torah on our hearts. The Torah is fulfilled for us in Christ. This is the new covenant. 
In the old covenant, it was external. We're going to try to live for the Lord on our own merits. We're gonna wear phylacteries of the Shema on our shoulder and our foreheads and try to show our, our devotion and piety towards God, but it never was enough. It never, it never could measure up. No, the Lord said, no, I'm going to have to write my law on your heart and then you will be able to do what? Here's where we get into application. Here's where you will be able to now watch this, obey me. You see, the Lord's already told us what he wants his kingdom to look like. He's already told us what he wants his kingdom citizens to act like, but they never could do it. Now, there were a few individuals who did really good in the Old Testament because the Holy Spirit was poured out on a few but Joel and Ezekiel said that God would pour out his spirit on many. This is the new covenant. And in order, and he did that, he wrote his law through his spirit in your heart when you believe by faith in Jesus Christ so you could do this. You see, because this pleases the Lord. He said in Exodus chapter 19 in the Mosaic, Mosaic Covenant, I am going to make you a kingdom of priests. Now think about that for a minute. If the, whole, if the whole nation of Israel, if they're all priests, who are they going to minister to? You can't minister to another priest. You can't minister to another Israelite since he's already a priest. The only people you can minister to are the people outside of Israel. That was God's plan all along. But the Mosaic Covenant was conditional. God says, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests, but you have to obey me. Well, they didn't do that. And so the Mosaic Covenant was obsolete in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. It was set aside and annulled in chapter 7 and verse 22 because it wouldn't work, it was never intended to work. It was a tutor to bring us to Christ, to show us our sinfulness, to say we need a deliverer, we need a Messiah. And once we put our faith in him, because he ratified the new covenant where? On the cross when he shed his blood. All of these covenants were always cut with blood. The Lord cut his own blood here. He shed his own blood and when he did, he ratified the new covenant so that when you placed your faith in him, he could then write the Torah now in your heart so that you could now obey him. You couldn't do that in the past, you can do it now through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, one last application, and that's a good one right there. We could stop right there, but there's one more. <clears throat> if I was going to have a title of this sermon, it would be, So Blessed. That's what it would be. Now, if you go over to Numbers, let me illustrate, chapter 6. Turn it with me real quick. Numbers, as we begin to close. Remember the priestly blessing by Aaron. <clears throat> Here it is, verse, beginning of verse 22. <coughs> This is how you're to bless the Israelites. That's what the Lord says. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, I've already shared with you that in the old days, we were aliens, we were separated, we were on the outside. Okay? We were foreigners because of this Mosaic covenant. Now, you could get to God, you just had to submit to the Mosaic covenant as a Gentile, but no longer. Gentiles don't have to do that anymore. Because what? Because the Lord tore down that wall. Okay? And something happened. Because he tore down that wall, now he was able to do something for you. Okay? Now watch this. 
Aaron is the one who is giving this priestly blessing to the Israelites. And what he's saying here is, may the Lord bless you and keep you. He's asking the Lord to do this some day. Someday. This is future. But now we come to the new covenant. And it's not Aaron speaking. It's Jesus. It's Yeshua. And when he blesses you, he doesn't say, Someday, he says, right now. Now watch. What does it mean to be blessed by the Lord? What is it that you have right now? This is exciting. Well, blessing uh, means happy, but that is not like you and I think about happy. It's inner bliss. It's inner bliss joy. Um, John called it unspeakable joy. You, you can't even describe it. It's indescribable. It's so incredible. It's, it's favor. Now, what does that mean? Why, why would you have all that? Why do you have all that? Why is that the experience of the Christian? Here's what happened. God, that just disappeared on me, man. Here's what happened. You got all the people <clears throat> on the face of the planet. How many, what is there, seven billion? And you've got the Lord. Now watch this. His face is turned away from them. But then one of them says, Lord, I want you to come into my life. I recognize that I need you. I am lost. I see my sinfulness. I see my separation. I understand that without you, I will die and I will go to hell. And that I have no hope in and of myself. And I know that you love me so much that you left heaven. You died on the cross just for me to take my place and to forgive my sins and to remember them no more and to give me new life. Come into my life and save me. Make me a child of God. Now when that happens, here's what God does. He turns his face to you. And look here at the priestly blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine and to be gracious to you, and may the Lord turn his face toward you. You know what the Lord did? He noticed you. You remember the first time you noticed your husband when he noticed you? You remember when you noticed? When he noticed you, how did that make you feel? Well, Allison, the first time I noticed her, she thought I was like Frankenstein, so it didn't do much for her. But for most of us, in the real world, you know how it made you feel. Made you feel good. Made you feel special. He's looking at me. He's noticing me. Well, that's what blessing is all about. Because my friends, through the new covenant and through what Christ has done for you, he has noticed you. And in his notice, he has made you his child. And he has made you his friend. With the Lord Jesus, he has made you his brother. And he has done this forever. Never to remember your sins anymore. God went through a lot of trouble. But he did it because actually he turned his face to you before the foundation of the world. God chose you and adopted you to be in his family. We are so blessed. Let's pray.
but what a great song we sang. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Man, what an awesome song. We are so blessed. Thank you, Father, for revealing to us and unveiling to us your plan. We're going places we've never been before. We're understanding things we never understood before. The new covenant, oh, it is better. It's much better than the old one. It's much better than Moses. Much better than Joshua. The promises of Joshua. It's much, much better than the priesthood of Aaron. It's much better than that old covenant, that old Mosaic covenant. And as we'll see in the days to come, it's much better than the tabernacle that's on earth, the one that's in heaven. Thank you for turning your face towards us. Blessing us. Giving us your favor. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.